Hello, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, your guide through the ARRL license manuals. The videos in this course follow the manuals section for section. You can get the ARRL license manuals from the source listed below the video. After you watch the video, dig into the corresponding section of the book, study the associated questions, and then come back for the next video. SWR stands for uh, the uh, uh, Standing Wave Ratio. And we might as well go that right away because it is a measure of the amount of energy that you put out into the antenna and then how much of that is reflected back. If the characteristic impedance of the antenna and the feed line match, then all the energy you send down the line will be going out and dissipated in the antenna. If they don't match, some of that gets reflected back at you and that can be a bad thing because one, it's not being transmitted on the air, so it's useless energy, and second, it'll come back in and heat up the uh, final amplifiers uh, in your radio, which is not a good thing. And so most, well, really all radios these days have what are called foldback circuits, so if it senses a lot of energy cutting back It'll just trim itself down to what it can really handle. Now, when we talk about matching, we're talking about impedance. Impedance is very, very much like resistance, except that it includes the effects of capacitance and inductance. And so a um, resistive impedance will just dissipate heat. But remember what we talked about before, a capacitor can release energy as the inductor absorbs it, the absorbs it releases it as the capacitor absorbs it. And you get real strong currents flowing back and forth and in certain situations that just heats up the metal in your uh, feed lines. You don't want to do that. Now, it's not such a big deal to get a decent match at two meters, although there are analyzers that you can use to check your antenna. Most antennas come to you uh, pre-built. They're in good shape. If you make your own, like a J-pole, which you can do very easily out of some copper plumbing pieces, um, and a lot of people make their own, uh, you'll need to borrow one of these meters. They're fairly expensive, like $350. Borrow one from a friend and get your antenna set up right. Now, on HF, that's another story. Uh, the antennas often don't match. For example, I use an 80 meter uh, full wave length uh, horizontal loop as my primary HF antenna, and so I need an antenna tuner to match that uh, all up with the transceiver and make thing, er, everything copacetic. So there really isn't that much. Let's talk a little bit about feed lines. Feed lines can be of one of two types. You can have two wires in parallel and when the voltage is going up this way, it goes down here and, and vice versa. It's a balanced kind of thing. Uh, the other is where you have a single wire that's sheathed in um, some metal, usually a, a metal braid or a metal coating. And in the ideal, the metal shield is at ground potential and it's just the uh, energy on that uh, inner line, in that one wire in there. Uh, now in practice it doesn't quite work out that way, but uh, it's close enough and we call this an unbalanced line. Now if we go from balanced line to unbalanced line, we have to use something called a balun, balanced to unbalanced. It's a form of a transformer that uh, takes the balance to the unbalanced. That's kind of part of what's uh, in an antenna tuner. And there are several different types of uh, uh, transmission lines that are shown here uh, in the book, uh, both of the balanced and the unbalanced kind. Now let me tell you what the common ones are. Most common is coaxial cable, by far. And there are two sizes. There's the full size, the RG8 or the LM400, which will handle up like the thousand watts or more. Now, none of my radio equipment puts that out, so I use smaller cable. I happen to particularly be partial to RG8X because it's easy to work with and it's not that expensive and the losses are reasonable even at VHF. And that's the coax I use most of the time. It shows in there the little adapters that are attached to it and so on. We'll cover a little bit more of that in a coming lesson. Um, and 
the as far as the uh, the parallel lines, uh, there's something called 450 ohm window line, which is really two parallel wires covered in plastic with little windows cut out in the middle to uh, make it a little bit lighter. Uh, make it a little bit easier to handle and that's how I feed my HF antenna I feed it with the window line because there's very low loss in window line and I want that when there's a high SWR uh, mismatch between the antenna and the transmission line now there's two places you can have the mismatch between the transmission or the transmitter and the line or between the line and the antenna Ideally, you'd put a tuner in both places, but that's usually not practical. So the tuner usually goes at the transmitter because it's right there where you can control it. You can buy remote tuners. They're kind of expensive. Sometimes they're even necessary, but it's usually easy to work around them. Now, a common dipole antenna is very, very often made of a half wavelength wire cut in the middle, half uh, the one side is fed, uh, there's an insulator in there, one side is fed by the coax braid, the other side is fed by the line inside the coax. Technically that's unbalanced to balance, but let me tell you, it works. It's something very easy. That's what your first HF antenna is going to look like. Thanks for following along with the videos and the book. After you've studied this section in the manual and are satisfied you understand the questions and their answers, come back here for the next video. The ARRL is the National Association for Amateur Radio, and I urge you to join, even if you don't have your license yet. That way you get QST, the League's monthly magazine full of articles for beginners and veterans alike, or you can choose On the Air, a magazine designed specifically for those new to amateur radio. Until we next meet, 73.